Now I just go and mess up. Mine in town to mine in town. No, you. And you were one step away from naming that turkey. Well, his face does kind of remind shh, shh. Don't say it. You name that bird, start making friends with it, and there goes my Thanksgiving appetite. That bird's name is dinner. <laughs> astonishment. Centuries of darkness had given way to an age of miracles and wonder. It was a time when magicians, called inventors, took us by the hand to a place called the future. Mary had a little lamb, it's speaking quite a small. To understand today's inventors, there is no better person to start with than this curious child. Some would call him a wizard. Others, the devil himself. His name was Thomas Alva Edison. These are among the world's earliest moving pictures made by Edison in the 1890s. History now had a life of its own, captured by his invention of the modern movie camera. In the twilight of his life, Edison had become the folk hero of the electrical age and the idol of aspiring inventors. His creative genius blossomed here in Menlo Park, New Jersey in the late 1870s. Within the sanctuary of his invention factory, countless triumphs took shape, including the perfection of the light bulb. In 1878, he captured sound on the world's first phonograph. Newspapers hailed him as a wizard. In 1932, Edison's last living assistant recreates the achievement. Hello, hello, hello. Here he had a little land. Its fleece was white as snow. Edison had not only put history in motion, he also gave it a voice. Sound was no longer a fleeting sensation in the ear. But his devotion to his work would take its toll. He often drove his assistants to work 60-hour marathons. In spite of their loyalty, he flew into chronic rages, firing everyone in sight. A prisoner of his own intellect, Edison spent days on end in his lab, neglecting his family. When his first wife, Mary, suddenly died from a brain tumor, Edison was overcome by remorse. In 1887, a young genius would challenge the grand master of invention. Nikola Tesla invented an alternating current generator to replace Edison's less efficient direct current system. Edison would attempt to persuade the public that alternating current was too dangerous for practical use. His agents convinced New York State prison authorities to use Tesla's alternating current for the world's first electric chair execution. The grisly stunt failed to sway popular opinion. From the first great power plant at Niagara Falls to the humblest household, the world would run on Tesla's alternating current. Tesla won the battle, but would die in obscurity. In spite of his faults, Edison was revered by his workers and beloved by the public until his death at the age of 81. To the world, he left behind over a thousand useful inventions, an unbeaten record that continues to inspire the inventors of today. One of them lives here in Foxborough, Massachusetts. He's known around town as being a bit different always on the lookout for uncanny solutions to commonplace problems. While his wife Mary tackles Chopin in the parlor, her husband plies the tools of his trade in the basement.
If you've ever wondered how inventors invent, just slip down the stairs and meet the resident wizard. A pioneer in the age of automation, his inventions were used around the world to create modern plastics, materials that allowed our first journeys into space. His name is Hole Bowditch. Mr. Bowditch is a direct descendant of a long line of innovators. His great, great, great grandfather designed some of England's finest church organs. Nathaniel Bowditch revolutionized the science of ocean navigation. Young Hole was to become the inventor in the family. His inventions had generated millions of dollars by the time he retired. But Hole can't seem to stop himself from tinkering. His current projects have little to do with fame or fortune. They are instead products of an inner magic, a childlike zest for life. For I am a pirate king. And it is, it is to Hole Bowditch, the biggest challenge facing an inventor is keeping an open mind and having a good time in the process. But it is, it is a glorious thing to be a pirate king. Hurrah the pirate king! Whole secret is very simply having fun! <laughs> At St. Mark's Episcopal Church, an insect attack would inspire an invention. The original cross on this church was destroyed by ants. And it was a solid wooden cross. Very heavy, weighed 8,000 pounds. So I made this. Bowditch invented a hollow cross designed to be carried and installed without the use of machines. The congregation lifted it into place using an elaborate system of pulleys. The invention behind the invention was the ingenious way it connected each person with the symbol of their faith. I don't know of an inventor who hasn't got a good imagination. And when you create things out of nothing, that's imagination. Out of nothing, but sunlight and mirror, Bowditch created an imaginary air force for bedridden children. This is a toy that is nothing but a mirror shaped like a plane. And you can adjust the speed of it by varying the distance that the weight is out from the front of the plane. In Grand Central Station they were running these things and actually the entire station was jammed up and they were having more fun. When you're a child, you've never got a better imagination. When you're educated, you bit by bit lose that ability to be imaginative, unless you are a special breed of cat who likes to, who, ne who never grew up. I, I don't think, I, I, I hope I never grow up. For I am a pirate king. Paul Bowditch continues to invent his way through life, powered by a childlike imagination. A gift many of us cast aside with our toys. Fun! <laughs> In Davis, California, a childhood obsession will drive another inventor to take the ultimate risk. A day from now, Paul Mahler will put his life on the line to get a dream off the ground. Did you know that the Toyota Camry was called the best car built in America? You did? That you didn't know that right now, during the 17th annual Toyotathon, you could get a Camry DX for nothing down and $249 a month. That's right, zero down and only $249 a month. Aren't you glad you know now? So is my dad. He's over there with my mom. This is great. It must be good. My dad is not easily impressed. He's like me. Toyotathon ends soon. Not going to get it. Are you okay? Yeah, no way am I gonna get it. I'm gonna fight it. I'm not gonna get it again this year. You don't look so good. When the tough gets sick, 
got the flu. The sick get tough with Tylenol flu. With maximum strength flu medicines plus extra strength Tylenol for the flu's tough aches and fever. I am not getting sick. I'm not getting the flu. Got the flu? Get tough on your flu with Tylenol flu. Hmm. And this is a guy thing, right? The all-new Tracer FX with its unique skin guard. Is this a sensitive part? Is designed to give a man a smooth shave with less irritation. Schick Tracer FX. You the sensitive type? I like that. Scampi champagne. I like it. Sparkling, delicious. No champagne tastes like Balatore. Frankly, I think it tastes better than champagne. One sip of Balatore, one sip says it all. When kids connect with a special adult friend, the results speak for themselves. Well, he keeps me on the right track. He tells me what's right from wrong. I really felt loved. Like I was a special person. I think she raised my self-esteem a lot. Because if I just want to reach for the stars. Now you know what having a special adult friend can mean to so many kids. So get involved. Call a volunteer organization in your community. Maybe next time they'll be talking about you. It's time to put children first. You know, you're doing a great job, but you're not using all your assets. With a body like that, you can go places. Sexual harassment makes you feel like less of a person. For Talk help and hotline numbers, ask for the Stop Sexual Harassment booklet at your public library. Be a little more sexy. Hey, we're talking about your job here. No, we're talking about sexual harassment here, and I don't have to take it. Sexual harassment violates you, and it violates the law. Say old Lang Zines in 1995 with a New Year's Eve football party. Virginia Tech tackles the Texas Longhorns in the Nokia Sugar Bowl. New Year's Eve on ABC Sports. In one week, meet Bill Foster. He's having a bad day. We stop serving breakfast at 11.30. I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, too. Academy Award winners Michael Douglas and Robert Duvall falling down. In one week, rental discretion advised. There's something about Neil Avedon that drives women mad. I had sex with her. That doesn't make me a murderer. Of course, that something got him locked up for murder. Steven Bochco's Murder One, Mondays at 10, 9 Central, starting January 8th on ABC. Paul Mahler became obsessed with inventing as a boy. His earliest projects, like this homemade Ferris wheel, had a lot to do with getting people off the ground. Today, Mahler's vision is almost a reality. He's invented a radically new private aircraft. It will take off vertically and reach speeds of up to 400 miles per hour. Computer software will allow the average person to fly with the same ease as we drive automobiles today. Are you off there? Close enough. But after 30 well, years of effort, more investment money must be raised to ensure that the first commercial model will be produced. No. Publicity attracts investors. To lure the media here, Mahler must get something in the air. Okay. The inventor uses various models to test the computer systems that will control the future aircraft. This saucer design has been made into a full-scale aircraft. The flying saucer was never meant to be sold to the public. It's merely a platform to test the efficiency of Mahler's computer system and it's ready to fly for the press meeting, just 24 hours away. What's my mental state? Oh, I, I'm still pretty calm, I suppose, and I guess I'll be even calmer if I find out tomorrow that we have re decent weather for the flight. That's my only real concern, quite frankly. But I'm going to fly unless the weather's atrocious. Before Mahler risks life and limb, a final series of model flights take place. Aside from weather concerns, there may be unknown dangers lurking within the machine itself. The initial tests are flawless. 
subtle commands from the controls are obeyed. Like a faithful pet, Mahler's machine comes to rest at its master's feet. One final precaution is now tested. A safety line will attach the aircraft to a tall crane during the flight tomorrow. Should the aircraft suddenly fall from the sky, the tether would break its fall before it hit the ground. Suddenly the model becomes ensnared in the tether. It's not a pretty sight. What the hell was that? In spite of the setback, it's too late to call off the demonstration tomorrow. Mahler's dream hangs in the balance. The thing that I personally would suffer the most from is the loss of, of the fulfillment of this dream that I've pursued for almost 30 years now. And uh, that's not something that I feel comfortable that I could recover. It's potential. I'm a very optimistic person, and I feel that I would be able to get back on the stream, but I know that it would be difficult because this is really a demonstration of what I've accomplished in the last 30 years. Nine a.m. The press gets its first look at Mahler's machine. When the Wright brothers announced their flight plans, no reporters bothered to attend. Today, Mahler has a full house. We're all going to be all lined up doing the same thing. The decision is made to use a safety line. A crane is put in place and a tether is attached to the aircraft. No matter what happens to the pilot, he cannot afford to build another machine. Whether successful or tragic, today's test will be seen by millions on the nightly news. Ironically, in an age of computer simulation, Mahler must perform to convince. Eight radically designed motors surround him. Pound for pound, each one generates four times the power of a typical aircraft engine. The moment of truth has come. must not only avoid the tether for safety reasons, he must also keep it slack to prove that the aircraft is flying on its own power. The press is soon convinced this invention has a future. Today, earthbound roads dictate where we go and where we live. Tomorrow, we may find a limitless highway in the sky. Well done, Paul. How does it feel? Generally, it felt good. It's really good. It flies nice. Of course, it flies itself. I'm just directing it. Actually, I'm just sort of the, I'm sort of the conductor. It, it does the, it plays the music. By facing risk, Paul Mahler keeps his dream alive. A vision that may one day fly into our future. Childhood flights of imagination will inspire inventors of another sort here at this elementary school just outside of Boston.
For the past five years, Nancy Justison's inventing class has taught children the art of problem solving. Try the inventing process by starting off with a bug list. Everyone is going to go off and think of things that bug them, things that annoy them. The things that bug you are the things that you need to find an answer to. How would that lead to an invention? Because you're working from what you think of, not what everybody else is thinking. Okay. You may use this for any invention ideas you have, so I'm just going to put this down so you can... All inventors share a priceless quality found in the uncluttered mind of youth. To meet a problem head on and let imagination take care of business. My best friend is out with the chicken pox, and so she can't be in here today to show her invention, but I'm going to show it for her. She goes to her babysitters, and I never know when the baby had to be changed or when it went to the bathroom. So to be able to know that, she made a diaper. It's called a peekaboo diaper where you could see when the baby went. My mother was yelling at me for wiping my nose and mouth all of my sleeve, and um, she couldn't wash it out, and so I invented the sniffle sleeve. And I just take this out and Velcro it to the sleeve, and then wipe my nose on the sniffle sleeve. I used to sit back in class and the teachers would get mad at me because they didn't want me to fall back and get hurt. So I made this chair so when you would tip back, you wouldn't fall backwards. What bugged me was um, my parents always made me rake the yard and it got real boring just sitting there um, like using a regular rake. So I attached a rake to the end of my bike. So. Um, I could just, like, ride my bike, but then when I wanted to rake my leaves, I could just take this out, and then you could ride your bike and rake the leaves at the same time. Not far from the Fowler School, another inventor crosses a place where a handful of revolutionaries shook the world. Here at Concord, Massachusetts, a band of farmers would confront British troops. The result was an experiment called America. Ray Kurzweil contemplates a revolution of his own, a passion that began in childhood. You envision something, and that has to energize you and a lot of other people to go through years of difficulty. I think if you realized all the challenges and difficulties you were going to go through, you might never start down this path. Kurzweil grew up in Queens, New York, the son of parents who fled Hitler's Europe. Well, my father was a musician, and he had a fascination with uh, mathematics and science, so I spent a lot of time talking to him about my science ideas. At the age of 17, he built a computer. As if that was not enough, he programmed it to compose music in the style of Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart. But helping others would become his most important theme. I think there's a sense in my family that, that what's important is to make a lasting contribution uh, that helps other people, that that's really what's important. His first great contribution came in 1976. Scanner moving to the top of page. A scanning camera combined with a powerful computer could recognize printed shapes. Now with technology, I can do things that uh, I've always wanted to do immediately, like reading this book. I can just simply... Kurzweil's invention could read to the blind. And this machine. And the this reading machine. machine captured the imagination of musician Stevie Wonder, who became an immediate fan. But no matter how versatile, the solo performer could never match the sound of blues bands, which featured several guitars, a harmonic, and drums together. Stevie Wonder would now challenge the inventor to make another dream come true. A musical machine like none other in the world. Lex Smooth Silhouette's pantyhose changes the rules. Don't spend your life in the gym. 
Don't skip dessert. Just look like you did with smooth silhouettes from legs. A dramatically different pantyhose that slims and smooths every crucial inch. From time. He had fever so you can rest man. Listen, the difference is night and day. The new Ford Taurus. When seen, it leaves an impression. When driven, creates a stir. When owned, lives up to its promise. And when judged, wins award after award after award after award. The new Ford Taurus. The success story that never ends. Making the dream come true. When the government asked them to save the world, they learned too many secrets. Redford, Phoenix, and Poitiers. There isn't a government on this planet. We'll continue in a moment. Stevie Wonder challenged Ray Kurzweil to invent a single keyboard that could synthesize the sound of any musical instrument. The inventor began a grueling series of recording sessions like these to discover how musical tones could be recreated. To do this, his team had to capture the sounds of real instruments, note by note. Okay, folks, stop. Let's try three dynamic levels on this. If you could announce the pitch before you play it. This is A2. The secret of real musical sound eluded them after countless attempts. Other inventors had failed at the same task and predicted Kurzweil would do the same. The solution had been ringing in their ears all along. Notes alone were not enough. Musical instruments make noise as well as pure frequencies. A piano hammer makes a hitting noise that becomes part of the musical note. This hidden sound had to be modeled on the computer along with musical notes to ultimately fool the ear. The attack is fairly immediate. Ray's ability to cope with failure mm -hmm. would ultimately save the project. Piano note. You really have to have the, the view that there's no such thing as failure, that failure is not acceptable, that failure is just success deferred. Kurzweil's synthesizer was born in 1984. But how would Stevie Wonder be able to program this complex machine without the benefit of sight? Okay, here I am with my new synthesizer. And uh, this is great. All these different keys and all these buttons, etc. This is incredible. But uh, here I have this uh, visual display. How will I know what it says? Hit record button to start and stop record. Kurzweil's music synthesizer could also talk. Aside from the robot-like voice, his invention could go a step further. Hi, Mom. 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 It could synthesize a real human voice and make it sing. Here at the Museum of Science and Industry in Los Angeles, California, Ray Kurzweil has set the stage for an unusual concert. Twelve synthesizers will play as a single orchestra to celebrate the fusion of art and science.
powers of musical sound and the power of the written word have found new expression through the inventions of Ray Kurzweil. But when the applause dies down, he will once again confront challenges all true inventors find impossible to resist. Far from the concert hall, a treasure trove of invention is carefully guarded. This cave, hidden in central Pennsylvania, contains a collection of wonders like none other on the planet. Only a handful of custodians are allowed inside the crash-proof gates. All visitors are required to carry fire extinguishers. An accidental blaze here would destroy over a century's worth of ideas. The cave could withstand a direct hit by a nuclear missile. Should man erase himself from the Earth, a visitor from another planet might stumble upon this place and surmise we were a species of inventors to the last breath. Encased in this rock shelter, the United States Patent and Trademark Office is preserving a legacy. Stacked to the ceiling are all the patents ever granted to inventors by the United States government. To win a patent, you must not only explain how your invention works, you must also prove that you thought of it first. To add speed to the patent process, government technicians at the cave will digitize four and a half million documents onto computer tapes. So far, barely 2% of the patents have been processed. It's all part of a monumental paper chase, one that begins every morning in Washington, D.C. 12,000 pieces of mail cross the Potomac River, headed for the Patent Office headquarters here in Crystal City, Virginia. Today's applications will join some 26 million already on file here. The patent office admits that over the years, some two million have been lost in the shuffle. This patent office library could be called the Room of Shattered Dreams. To win a patent, inventors hire researchers to discover whether anyone else has beaten them to the punch. Until the files are computerized, Researchers must thumb through hundreds of related patents to prove that an invention is truly unique. Like the cave, the search room houses nearly every U.S. patent ever granted. Where some of these inventions have bettered mankind, others were better left alone. This alarm clock simply beats you awake. If it doesn't give you a headache, this fire escape will. A person can dance with this imitation partner, but forget the small talk. Patent examiner Nick Cadici believes our social values are reflected by inventions like the mousetrap. Sometimes you can track society and track history through uh, the different types of inventions in the same f area of technology. You have your guillotine and you have your openings around the side. And theoretically, you can catch mice by the individual mouse going inside the hole. And today in the 1990s, there's a concern for animal rights and so on. Even mouse rights, I guess. And here we have a mouse trap that will capture a mouse live and you can escort that little mouse out of your house and let him go outside in the woods. Building better mousetraps is the theme of some 3,000 patents on file. But recently the government has given mice a chance to fight back due to the work of patent examiners like Al Tannenholz. In 1980, his department granted a patent to genetic engineers at Harvard their invention? A 
A mouse especially sensitive to the causes of cancer. If you think that all this patent stuff has little to do with your life, don't tell Al. The shoes you wear, the clothes you put on, the food that you eat, your dishwasher, your washing machine, your TV, and even just fabrics, the way they're made, the kind of materials that go into them. I mean, basically, the patent system touches almost everything. From rodents to rockets, examiners share the thrill of being the first to see the world's newest ideas. I go into an application and I read it and learn. So I'm involved in two wonderful things, a detective story and academic learning. What could be better? And this happens maybe two, four th times a week. I mean, this is great. You call that a job? Well... A patent provides an inventor with a 17-year monopoly on production and profits. But recently, an extraordinary invention would embroil the patent office in a battle that would rage for years. The stakes were high, for this device would affect nearly everyone on the planet. Pure light of majestic beauty and stunning power emerged from an invention called the laser. Surface molecules are blasted from a fingernail. The tissue underneath is unharmed. A notch is cut in a match head without so much as a puff of smoke. This ultraviolet laser developed at IBM fires short bursts of energy without creating heat. A strand of human hair now becomes the target. Magnified a thousand times, the staggering precision of this laser is demonstrated. Used as a scalpel, it will allow surgeons to perform the most delicate of operations. Lasers are now hailed as one of the greatest inventions of our century. Here at Plasmatronics in Albuquerque, New Mexico, Gordon Gould tests a powerful laser. Gould's incredible journey as an inventor was sparked by his childhood hero. The accomplishments of Edison were an inspiration for me. All of a sudden, he said, here's something that can be done, and nobody had even thought that something should be done, like inventing a light bulb. My God, this guy has come up with something that changes the whole world. As portrayed in this recreation, Gould's world would change overnight with a flash of insight while a graduate student at Columbia University. In 1957, after years of research, Gould discovered a method of amplifying light inside a chamber of mirrors to produce beams of intense energy. Within 48 hours, Gould was certain he had cracked the secret of how a laser could be made. Gould believed his notes proved he was the first to conceive of the laser, a crucial step in winning a patent. To establish the date of his discovery, the inventor rushed to a notary public to have his notebooks witnessed. That day would mark the beginning of a nightmare I'd like that. that would last for 30 years. That'd be 25 cents a page, sir. Convinced his patent rights were safe, Gould worked for months on a detailed application that described not one, but several laser devices. It was a tragic delay. He was not alone in the race to invent the laser. Professor Charles Towns, an established scientist and inventor, was working along similar lines. Towns and fellow physicist Arthur Shallow beat Gould to the punch by filing a much simpler application for a laser months before Gould. The government ruled that despite the dates on Gould's notebooks, the earlier filing by Towns and his partner would be honored. 
Even though their laser was impractical, they would also receive Nobel Prizes. Credit for Gould's other laser inventions would be disputed by a host of other scientists. The young inventor who hoped to change the world watched helplessly as his integrity fell under attack. I was all alone and nobody was helping me. The whole thing was just sort of snatched away from me and the frustration was just unbearable. Patent examiners struggled for years to decide on Gould's remaining claims. Hi, Gordon. Good to see you. Meanwhile, the desperate inventor sought help from a legal firm and patent attorney Dick Samuel. This meeting recreates a relationship begun in 1975. At first, the stranger seemed like a hopeless eccentric. People with certain kinds of emotional problems, some of them go to priests, some go to psychiatrists, and, and some of them wind up with patent attorneys. When I met Gordon, I wasn't sure uh, whether I was dealing with that phenomena or whether he really had invented a laser. But Gould's documentation was so compelling, Samuel took the case. He crisscrossed the country, assembling evidence for an appeal to the government. Two laser patents were finally awarded to Gould. It was a crucial victory. Samuel could now take giant corporations to court and ask for royalties owed to Gould. Segment of it. Digest these documents within the next uh, three or four days. Mm. By 1984, Samuel's campaign was in high gear when a phone call brought devastating news. As a result of intense legal actions by the laser industry, the government had revoked Gould's patents. His companion, in and out of court, Marilyn Apple, witnessed the effects of a bitter struggle. I think it tired him out in a slow, insidious way. But I think that it had a cumulative effect that made him tired and perhaps made him less creative than he might otherwise have been in the years after the laser. In spite of the disaster, Gould never lost faith in the value of invention. Of course we need these inventions. It's made the world a much more pleasant place to live, despite the complications that they sometimes bring in. I wouldn't want to live any age previous to the present one, and in fact, I regret not living in the next age where I can see some marvelous things coming down the road. Today, Gordon and Marilyn own homes in Virginia and Colorado, due in part to the system of laws designed to protect inventors. The government looked into Gould's case once again and finally reinstated his patents. Against overwhelming odds, a lone inventor had taken on the government and a powerful industry in one of the longest struggles in the annals of invention. Like his idol, Thomas Edison, Gould had won his place in history. But unlike Edison, Gould sets time aside to enjoy the finer things in life. Dig into that lobster there. A picnic on a mountaintop is an excellent way to forget the past and contemplate the future. It's a treat Gould can now afford. Today, lasers are a billion dollar industry. In return for a 30 year nightmare, Gordon suddenly found himself a multi millionaire. A tribute to Gould's hero is about to take place at the Henry Ford Museum near Detroit, Michigan. Here in 1928, Ford reconstructed Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory. Today, countless visitors come to see his invention factory. Edison's workers used to work all night long sometimes, and they'd start to nod off and go to sleep, and they wouldn't be thinking about inventing. So Edison or one of his co-workers would sneak up behind the guy very quietly, and he'd go right in his ear. The guys used to call this a corpse reviver. Now, we've talked a lot about some of Edison's inventions. What do you suppose his most important invention was? Was it the light bulb? Let's see a show of hands. 
How about the phonograph? How many do you think that was important? How about the movies? Was that important? Yeah, I guess that was pretty important. But guess what? It wasn't the movies. It wasn't any of these things. Because you're standing in Edison's most important invention, the laboratory itself. He invented ways to use electricity and to make it more useful. Electricity. Long after the crowds have gone, stand very quietly and you may sense the presence of Edison's apprentices working into the night. They followed a wizard and never realized they themselves were his greatest invention. Restless minds, harnesses one. Magic will soon envelop the lab again. Todd, how far are you from being ready to fire? Do we want to put some Modern day on? magicians have arrived from Hollywood. Number 14, any They've brought along some fancy inventions to celebrate the 110th anniversary of the light bulb. The matrix right away. Invited guests have heard that Edison himself, or an awfully good imposter, may make an appearance tonight. It only seemed fitting that a real inventor ought to play Edison. I'm going to have you take your glasses off so I can do around your eyes, okay? okay. That's great. Just close your eyes for me and relax. A hundred and ten years ago, we changed the world by just burning a tiny little piece of bamboo inside of a glass ball. It lasted 170 hours. Now that was exciting. But when I look around the world today, wow! What's that word you say? It's awesome! Why, you've shot a spacecraft clear outside the solar system just for the heck of it. But back here on Earth, we've still got some problems. We can't predict all the problems some of our inventions are going to create down the road. That's where you young folks come in. All you dreamers and doers, work hard together. And don't be afraid to fail. I was never afraid of failing. It's what you do after you fail that counts. But I'll let you in on a little secret. I was afraid of one thing. I was afraid of the dark. We sure took care of that, didn't we? A rainbow of laser light salutes the creative genius of inventors. From out of the inventive mind has come the vision that shapes our modern world. Despite the hardships, the countless failures, and personal risks, inventors continue a quest that knows no bounds. The spirit of invention lives in all of us. But while we confront the challenges of the present, inventors journey ahead to explore the future. Alignment every time. Even if you've never done a crunch before, the Ab Roller Plus actually helps lift your head and shoulders so that you fully contract your abs without all the strain. From the very first rep to the last, your head will rest comfortably on the thick pad while neck and shoulder strain is minimized. And now, the original Ab Roller Plus comes complete with power stands to give you a sit-up motion unlike anything else. So call this toll-free number now and order the Ab Roller Plus with power stands for only $89.85. 
If you order now, you can even pay in three easy monthly payments of only $29.95 with absolutely no finance charges. Try the Ab Roller Plus at home for 30 days at no obligation. Check out its extra thick, high density padding and health club quality steel backed by a limited lifetime warranty. And if you're not completely satisfied, return it for a full refund. Don't be confused by imitations. Give your body the one that works, the Ab Roller Plus. It's designed for men, women, young and old. And if you order right now, we'll include Brenda Digraph's 15 minute video on 1995 value at no extra cost. The video leads you step by step through the five moves in the five minute beginner program. Then move up to the full 10 minute advanced routine. It's what you'll need for the abs you've always wanted. So call now, right now, because it's never too late to start. Get the original Ab Roller Plus complete with power stands for only $89.85. Then get the fastest route to your flattest abs ever. The Ab Roller Plus. It's your chance to do something for yourself. Call now. today are turning out students who lack the skills they need to compete in today's job market. But there's a way to improve education. Children who learn music and art and dance and drama are more likely to want to come to school, and they do better academically, and students at risk often keep out of trouble. But when money's tight, the arts are the first things to be cut, and children who grow up without the arts are deprived of a part of their development they can never recover. Hi, I'm Eddie Lewis. And I'm Don West. Join us for America's premier sports collector show tonight at 2 a.m. exclusively at Shop at Home right here on WWOR UPN 9. UPN 9's A Plus for Kids salutes the best of New Jersey's public school teachers. Carol H. Woloski of the East Lake School in Persephone and Marianne Kinnam of the Mount Horeb School in Warren. Congratulations to all our A Plus teachers. Janice is one of four million people suffering from Alzheimer's disease. There are days when she can't even remember the name of her illness. But thousands of researchers are working on a cure, so that one day we won't remember the name of it either. For more information, call for a free fact sheet. that ab workouts have to be difficult, time-consuming, and painful. And for those of you who thought you'd never have a taut, firm waist, well, I've got good news. Now, you've got a second chance. Hi, I'm Brenda Dycraft, and I know you've got a lot of choices when it comes to buying an abdominal workout product. I've seen almost all of them, and I've tried many of them. Between you and me, hey, if you're looking for a gimmick, they're out there. But if you're serious about getting back to basics and developing rock-hard abs and a trim, toned waist, well, there's only one choice. It's the Ab Roller Plus. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the last abdominal product you'll ever have to buy. I remember when I first started working out nearly 15 years ago. I was doing setups with my feet under my mom's sofa. Man, things have really changed, haven't they? Well, I didn't use a sofa, but I was almost as bad. The fact is, for as long as I can remember, I've been trying to develop rock-hard abs. And I have to confess, I've tried almost everything on the market, just hoping for something that really works. Well, the sad fact is, you're not alone. A lot of us have done some pretty crazy things to trim our waist. The bottom line is, you spent a lot of time and money trying to get a leaner, sexier midsection without seeing any results. Frankly, that's a real shame, when a lot of the ad products on the market just don't deliver the benefits they promise. 
You're right, and that's really unfortunate. Because what we need is help, not hype. When we buy a workout product, we want it to deliver the goods. But what I don't understand, with so many ab products available, why aren't people getting the results they need? Well, it's because up until now, there hasn't been a good home product that addresses the biggest problem people have every time they do a sit-up. The number one complaint I hear is not, oh, my abs hurt, it's, I can't believe how much my neck hurts. I mean, I believe that's the reason most people quit their ab program. Watch this. When people do a sit-up, they have to lift their head and shoulders off the floor. Now, this causes strain in the muscles of their neck and shoulders. And you may end up quitting too soon before you get enough of a workout to really make a difference in your abdominals. Let's face it, whenever you do a crunch with your head unsupported, you're actually trying to lift almost one-third of your body weight off the floor. Watch this. When you come up in a sit-up, look, I'm lifting about a third of my body weight. And so are you. So if you weigh 150 pounds, think about it. That's nearly 50 pounds you lift up every time you contract your abdominals. You know, it's no wonder. Some people quit training before their abs have a chance to get a full workout. They're probably fed up with the stress and exertion they feel during each and every rep. <laughs> but women still want a small weight. And I don't know one man who likes having his belly hang over his belt. <laughs> That's for sure. So to find out what to do about it, we went to one of the world's foremost fitness authorities, Dr. Fred Hatfield. Hi, Dr. Hatfield. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. In addition to training professional athletes and Olympic athletes, Dr. Hatfield, you've definitely put your theories into practice. I mean, you have won over 30 world record titles. And at the age of 45, he lifted over 1,000 pounds on his back and won the world title in powerlifting. I mean, you've got to have strong abdominals and a strong back, right? Well, I do, Brenda. You're quite right. <laughs> you know, but all athletes in any sport needs to have strong abdominals, strong midsection in general. But it's not restricted in importance to athletes. Every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth needs a strong midsection for several very practical reasons. Every time you pick up a child or throw something or serving up a volleyball, everything that you do requires a strong midsection. Don't forget, Brenda, the abdominal midsection area connects your upper body to your lower body. There are several different muscles in the midsection. You have internal and external obliques, you have upper and lower abs, you have erector spinae in the back. Now, most people, as they age, tend to become more and more sedentary, and gravity begins to take its toll. Those inner organs inside your abdominal cavity, they begin to distend out, creating that characteristic pot belly. Now, there's a problem with that. As that pot belly gets bigger and bigger, you've got to compensate for it by leaning back. And that is going to put a lot of stress on those nerves running down through the spinal canal in your lower back. Let me show you some of the versatility of this tremendous device we call the ab roller. Okay. Jeremy is going to demonstrate some movements. First of all, notice that his head is resting on a pad. Right. No longer is he going to get neck strain from doing regular crunches. Mm -hmm. The second thing that you look at is that this is an excellent cruncher because he's getting all of the upper abdominal wall. Sure. Right? Unfortunately, this is where most people stop their abdominal training. They think that crunchers does it all, and it doesn't. So we're going to do a little variation here, Jeremy. Lay your legs to the side, and now crunch, and you'll see that we're getting the external obliques on this side, plus the right abdominal. Right. Now, Jeremy, feet are straight apart, and now bring your upper and lower body together, way out, and then together. Now we're getting the lower abdominals and the external obliques. It's just a great exercise device. The bold new Ab Roller Plus is changing the way people are working their abs. Absolutely. It supports the weight of your head and neck during each and every rep. I mean, now you can relax your neck and shoulder muscles without straining them. Your movements can be slower and more concentrated, and that means a longer, more effective workout with real results. And even if you've never done a crunch or setup before, the Ab Roller design places you in correct position every time. It's almost like having your own private trainer. And best of all, the curved side rails actually help you raise your head and shoulders while you rock gently forward and backwards. You can concentrate on contracting your upper, middle, and lower abs, as well as your obliques. The Ab Roller Plus is revolutionary. It's an abdominal product that makes sit-ups and crunches easier to do, while at the same time maximizing your results. Now let me show you how easy it is to get started with my exclusive five moves in five minutes routine for beginners. I'm going to be doing a few reps of each move, so watch close. All you have to do, place your head on the neck pad, elbows on the side, and bring your body up in a natural crunch. 
You'll notice my neck isn't strained at all, and yours won't be either. Then you can extend your hands to work your upper abs, bringing it up. And you can include your lower ab workout with it by lifting through the hips, bringing it up. And you don't want to forget the obliques. So bring your legs to the side, and you bring your body up. That's what you're working right there. If you've been taking notes on how to do Brenda's five-minute beginner's workout, stop. It's all in the exciting 15-minute video included free when you order the Ab Roller Plus. We'll give you the toll-free number to call in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to say this. The Ab Roller Plus and its results are for real. But don't take our word for it. We gave the Ab Roller Plus to 20 people just like you. We asked them to try it for four short weeks, no strings, no hype, just their opinions. But before we did, we asked them why they were frustrated and had given up their dreams of having flat, hard abdominals. Listen to what they had to say. It'll probably sound all too familiar. I'm a mother of two, and because of them, I have this. I don't like when I get out of the shower and I look in the mirror and my waist is as wide as my chest, no matter what.